All right, so I would like to begin with how I started off. I started off like any kid does with Legos. And from there, I went on to make these realistic looking Lego cars that I would post on um, a popular Lego sharing website. And so from there, I went on to programming. And my very first app that I ever programmed was a doodle jump app on a calculator. And at that time, I know my friends had doodle jump on their iPhones and iPods. And I wanted to port it to, an, uh, to, a, to a calculator. And so I thought, you know, what would be the hardest thing? And I thought of Doodle Jump. So I, I said, you know, why not go step by step and actually port it to a calculator? This first app that I made has over 1,000 downloads now. So this was the first step. So ever since then, I've moved on to Android. And this time around, my apps um, are a bit more successful, let's say, uh, with 250,000 downloads and upwards on some of them. I'd like to talk to you about one of them, uh, Sidebar. This was um, an app that was released in February. And uh, so it basically lets you um, access your popular, you know, your most favorite apps from anywhere. It's brilliant multitasking and task management. There's also rounded corners. This one's an interesting story. Who would ever want an app that rounds the corners of your screen, right? I thought it was, an April, it was a good April Fool's joke. So when I posted this up on uh, the internet, I said, you know, sorry, I'm kind of late for April 1st. I missed it. Oh, well. And so this app actually was my most popular one. And on the third day, on just that day, on that 24-hour that period, got 21,000 downloads just on that third day. OK. And this is an app that I've announced before, but I would like to you know, showcase it at this conference as well. Switcher is an app that's going to revolutionize task switching for Android. But I have something else up my sleeve. I'm going to announce a new app that no one has ever seen before. And it's called Visual File Explorer. What Visual File Explorer does is it shows you how big all the folders of your Android are so that you know which folders are taking up all your data. It's file management revolutionized. But after I've done all this programming and you know, Android app development, I've gotten into something new that you know, I'm really interested in. Because programming is like the, you know, the kind of, it's not really tangible. So I've been got getting into robotics recently. And I'm here to talk to you about world domination by robots. <laughs> OK. So how many of you, you know, just by a show of hands, think you use a robot on a daily basis, or many robots? Yeah, OK. So this is what most people think of robots, because that's how the movies portray them. Um, they're, you think they're like humanoid um, you know, kind of clones of us. But in reality, this is the type of robot that we use now. They're mechanical creatures that are more simple than humans. And I think this is the kind of robot that's going to be um, in the future you know, dominating our lives. So let's take a um, look at this quote that my good friend uh, posted on Facebook one time. They call 3D printers robots, too. Should I call my inkjet printer a robot? No, it's not cool enough. It doesn't deserve to be called one. <laughs> OK, so let's look at the definition of a robot. This is the actual definition. A machine capable of carrying out a complex series of instructions automatically. So could these be robots, too? Could your, your toaster at home be a robot? I mean, it, too, carries out a complex series of actions, right? Um, you, you put your toast in. It, you know, it's after a certain amount of time, it pops them up. What about your TV, your, your oven, your dishwasher? In a sense, they're all robots. But much like living organisms, they vary in complexity. So our lives today are dominated by you know, technology that we use every day, like our cell phones, our Facebook, our Twitter, our Google+. Um, in, in the future, we'll be even more reliant on machines that make our lives easier, allowing us to live more freely than ever. In an age where hardware and software um, are at the forefront of human innovation. Groundbreaking discoveries that change the way we live are created every day by ordinary people like you and me. And what better way to integrate hardware and software than with robotics? So this summer, I've been working on a robot that's actually over here. Um, this robot can be controlled from anywhere. And so I would like to showcase this a little bit. The vision was to create a capable robot that can be remotely controlled from anywhere. And this is what it is. It's a successful prototype. Making it a reality was quite a process. So you know, it, the, the robot has um, a, a router for connecting to the LTE network. Um, it also has a computer on board that runs Linux. It, also, it can be controlled from anything that has internet access. So I, I mainly use an Android app that tells me, you know, that lets me control the robot. 
So how is it controlled from anywhere? So my tablet, or whatever I'm using to control it, could be anywhere. Um, so that router in the middle would be my home router, and that tower would be a cell phone tower. So this robot talks to the cell phone towers, and you know, you know, nowadays everywhere there's cell phone towers, right? So this can pretty much be anywhere where there's a cell phone tower, and I can talk to it, and I can control it. It has a phone on board. Um, that phone is for Skype, so I can see what it's seeing, and it can, you know, it can display my whatever I am doing on the screen of the phone. So further into the technical stuff, um, basically the onboard computers run, runs uh, four programming languages, or four or three, you could, you know, <laughs> give or take. <laughs> so it, it, it runs Linux. There's a Java ser um, server that's always pinging something like to check if, if I'm controlling it. Um, there's, all, uh, there's a C++ you know, doing some communicating between the pins of the motor driver and the, the, the computer. And there's Python also to, for another local server that's um, communicating between Java and C++. OK, so obstacles. Um, the biggest obstacle is if you look at the speed test, they're not very high. And for Skype, you need a m much more speed than that. So that's the biggest obstacle. But as our networks get faster, you know, you know, this will become more, more of an easier thing to do. So I'd like to demonstrate with a video. This is just a compilation of Instagram videos right, I posted. so here it is. No, no wires, wires attached. attached. All wireless. All right, so let's run for the first time. So as you can see here, it's basically being controlled by me from my room. Okay, so on another note, you know, I've always imagined myself in the future being a software engineer, sitting at a cubicle, programming in my sleep, it, as if I don't al already do that, right? Um, but I've also imagined, you know, what if I was a mechanic? What if I build stuff, like fix cars and stuff? But that's not okay with my mom. <laughs> she always said, you have to grow up to be an engineer. No other option. <laughs> But mechanics are engineers too. And then she would give me that look, like, no, <laughs> that denial. So that's when I decided I'd rather be a roboticist and get to have the best of both worlds. It's a win-win situation. Last year, I was lucky enough to actually get a job as a roboticist. And that's where I've been working ever since. Um, and you know, through my experiences at work, I've learned a great deal about the, it's the practical appliances of robotics. So if you look at a simple creature like, say, a caterpillar, right? Um, you can replicate its, its, um, its like, functions um, in a robot really simply. And we already have a program for people younger than teenagers to do um, things like this that replicate simple functions of robots really well. And this is um, a picture from the first LEGO League competition. So at our, at our school, we have a program called um, FIRST FRC. And it, it's a robotics club. And so we participate in a bigger competition than these guys. 
So four stands for uh, for inspiration in for inspiration of recognition of and recognition of science te technology. So we have six weeks to build a robot that has to accomplish something. This is our robot at one of the competitions in Washington. Um, last year's competition was to throw frisbees into a rectangular goal. It involves collaborating with mentors and really, you know, getting to know your teammates. So it's not so much about how much you know, it's about communicating with other people to make something really cool. And we also prepare for friendly competitions. So we're not talking about like lasers or kung fu robots or something, you know, not something destructive. It's something constructive where you help other teams to get as far as they can. One year we helped one team who barely just came into the competition uh, with just parts and we helped them get to nationals. And last year we were actually lucky to get to the world championships and this is a picture from uh, my phone <laughs> as I was in the world championship. So you can see it's such a big event. And I think more events like these are needed so that more people are interested in STEM at a young age because that is vital to our future. So one of the most important lessons we learned from robotics is that gracious professionalism and teamwork are some of the most important things you can get out of it. Not that you can program in Java or C++ or whatever. It's that you can be graciously professional. So at one of the competitions, they always talk about world domination. So, you know, it's true. Robots are going to dominate our world in the future, if not already, because we rely on them every day. As you saw with my analogy to the toaster and everything like that. Your cell phone in your pocket, um, that's a robot. Um, robots are making everything you buy. Your car, your, your, you know, your furniture sometimes is assembled by robots. Your, you know, your oven, everything is made by a robot. Even robots are being made by robots, right? So wearable tech. Wearable tech is something new that's you know, coming. And I think that's really merging man and machine. And I think in the future, we're going to be moving towards something that merges man and machine. So we already have robots that can you know, mimic creatures like um, you know, four-legged creatures. We have a robot that can run at 28 miles an hour. It's a cheetah, basically. We also have robots that fly like real birds. And so automation and interconnectivity are the future of robotics. But there's something new that's even more interesting than that. And that is, you know, biologically giving robots a conscious, like a consciousness. And so right now, artificial intelligence has not developed to a point where it can actually, you know, determine, it can actually be used to have a robot determine exactly what it should do. Every robot we made as a human species has been made by one of us, obviously, right? So they only do what we tell them to do, even if it seems artificial. So another um, important thing to note is that nanotechnology is on the rise. And soon we can have nanorobots in our bloodstreams making sure that we don't get cancer or anything, any other disease like that. And so this could be a, a, a solution to the problem of you know, big natural diseases. So I would like to end with a note that 10 years ago, you, know, you didn't have your smartphone. You didn't have your Facebook. You didn't have your Google Plus. Not, no, neither did you have your Instagram or Miley Cyrus. But um, if you think about it, 10 years is not a long time for the older generation here. But just that amount of time has changed the world so much. So we can't really comprehend what's going to happen 10 years later. But one thing is for sure, that the world is going to be dominated by robots. Thank you.